the wall. Roman church agreed on this, but the Persian church at this time had agreed on something else, defended by a theologian called Nestorius. Nestorius said that Jesus was constituted of two distinct natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And the Persian church and the Roman church couldn't agree on that and were fighting on that, so the Persian church decided that it would not depend on Rome anymore that it would be an independent church, an autocephal church. So, around 500, we have the Roman Universal Church and the Persian Nestorian Church. But another theologian is going to claim that nor the Trinity nor the Nestorianism suits him. Because he thinks that Jesus is both human and holy, and that his holiness being superior to his human nature it absorbs it. Therefore, this theologian claims that Jesus has only one nature, which is holy, only holy. This theologian was called Jacobardius. Of course, his theories were refused by the Roman and Persian churches, but he had a lot of influence in the southeast side of the Roman Empire. We call this church, which follows Jacobardius, the Jacobite church. If the Jacobites are mainly in the Roman Empire, the regular wars between the Roman and Persian Empire and the subsequent frontiers and population movement are going to bring some Jacobites within the Persian frontiers. The Jacobites cannot go back in the Roman Empire and are going to settle in the Nineveh Plain. It is during the 3rd century that was established for the first time um, an organized Christian community in Iraq. And it took place behind me, laying southwest, in uh, what's called the Nineveh Plain. Yeah, here, uh, yeah, this guy was supposed to tell you something interesting, but in fact he's not really, so um, I turned the noise off. But still, what you see behind him is uh, the Nineveh Plain, so where the Jacobites were around 500 after the Common Era, and where Isil was before the Battle of Mosul. They were in places like Marmatai, Partella, and Karkosh. The Nestorians were in the capital, of course, but also in Alkosh, Teleskov, Batnaya, and Ankawa, and in the southeast of Turkey. So we get our Christian communities in Iraq, the Nestorians and the Jacobites. But what language do they speak? The elites are largely Hellenized, but not the common people. يمكن أن تقول لي ماذا هذه الكتابة؟ هذا الكتابة اللغة الأرامية التي تكلم بها سيد المسيح ومنها لحد الآن هي أقدم لغة تكلم اشتق اشتقوها المسيحيين لحد الآن يتكلمون بها. Here we are in the Alkosh Monastery, so an old Nestorian monastery where there are many beautiful Aramaic texts. Aramaic was the language used by Jesus of Nazareth. It's a Semitic language as are the Hebrew and the Arabic. It's still used in the Christian ceremonies, and its modern form is called the Syriac. So when you hear that someone speaks Syriac, in fact, he speaks a modern form of Aramaic. Let's recap. We have three forms of Christianity, mainly depending on theological beliefs concerning the nature of God. The Universal Church, God is one in three natures. The Universal Church is a common church of the Roman Empire. The Nestorian Church, God is one in two natures. The Nestorian Church is in Persia. And the Jacobit Church. God is one in one nature. The Jacobit Church is in the eastern part of the Roman Empire and in Persia, mostly close to Mosul in the Nineveh Plain. And finally, we had a few words concerning the language that was spoken in the region. The elites use the Greek, and the common people, such as Jesus was, use the Aramaic, Semitic language, as are the Arabic or the Hebrew. 
and then happens something. We are now around 650 and the big event is the Muslim conquest. So, the new conquerors bring with them a new religion, Islam. And with Islam appeared the Dhimmi status. So, a particular status that those who were not Muslims had to follow. With this status came some rules. Like a Christian woman had to become Muslim if she wanted to marry a Muslim, and the contrary was not possible. Uh, if you were a Christian, you could not convert a Muslim, whereas they could convert you and you had to pay the jizya, which a Muslim didn't have to pay. But still, the Christians were happy that this new Muslim conqueror arrived. Why? Why is that? Firstly, because since the Christians paid the jizya and had to follow some rules that didn't have to follow the new Muslim conquerors, those same Muslim conquerors, in return, were offering them something huge at the time their protection. The Christians living on the land which is currently Iraq would finally, with the Muslim conquest, be under protection. Secondly, because they were exhausted by the endless clashes between the Roman and the Persian Empire. And on the contrary, the Muslims came with a new organized society, a very organized society. So the Christians saw the new order as a way to find prosperity. And last, but not least, because those Muslims happened to be also Arabs. That is to say, Semitic people. And the Christians were, in their majority, Assyrians. That is to say that they were also Semitic people. Just a little jump in time here, but I was in this cafe in Ankara too, a refugee camp near Erbil, and I took a short video to show you how close the Christians Assyrians are culturally from the Arabs in the region. I mean, you couldn't guess that they are Christians. They have all the typical characteristics that people would associate with Arab Muslims. No woman in the cafe, only men, playing dominoes and drinking tea. In fact, this kind of atmosphere doesn't give us any clue about whether these people are Muslims or Christians. Okay, let's go back. So, despite the Dimi status, for these three reasons, the fact that they could now be under protection, the fact that they were now facing a very organized society, and the fact that the Muslims were Semites, that is to say culturally close to them, for those three main reasons, the Christians welcomed the Arab Muslim new conqueror with opened arms. But it went further than that. In fact, with the Islamic conquest also happened kind of a golden age for the Christians. This was really one of the most prosperous times for the Christians in the region. Why? The Christians, whether they were Jacobites or Nestorians, had, through their religion, a proximity with the Greek world and were able to transcript all the writings of the Hellenistic world in Arabic. An example with Marmatai. This is a monastery of Marmatai, which is a central place for the Syriac uh, Orthodox Church history. Uh, this church was called the Jacobite Church until the 17th century. During the Arab conquest, uh, the Syriac led the translation and uh, transcription of all the knowledge of the antiquity. So, because they could enrich with knowledge the Islamic power, and because the Islamic power was, especially at this time, intellectually very curious, then because of that, during centuries, the Christians were pampered. They quickly took an important place within the elites. They were bringing to the new power a vast diversity of knowledge that they were able to translate from Greek to Aramaic and then from Aramaic to Arabic. We are talking about astrophysics, about uh, sciences in general, uh, mathematics, about uh, hydraulics, about philosophy. 
So the Syriac uh, had a very important part in the uh, magnificence of the Islamic Empire. And Marmatai was one of the important places which uh, uh, took part in this diffusion of knowledge. Yes, Jacobite Marmatai was an important place, and thanks to those competencies, the Christians were occupying high positions within the Caliphate. But the Golden Age for the Christians lasted less than two centuries. After this period, the Demisteris was sometimes applied with a particular rigidity. Especially when a freshly converted ruler was looking for legitimacy. Historians generally agree on the fact that during these periods, many citizens, Christians or not, preferred to convert to Islam than to be under such pressure. A pressure especially strong, for instance, under the Seljuk dynasty. To sum up, the Islamic conquest has been welcomed by the Christians. The Demisterius was given to them with advantages and disadvantages. But overall, under the new Islamic power, they have been living a golden period, a golden age, thanks to the transmission of the antiquity knowledge to the new power. A golden period which lasted less than two centuries after what many Christians converted to Islam in order to avoid regular discriminations. And then comes a new era. Hey!